to that song without it sending shivers down my spine. If you have ever been to the General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association at the service of the living tradition, they play that song as the ministers process in for the ceremony that celebrates um, preliminary and full fellowship, retirement, and honors the lives of those who have died in the year. And it's also one of our few songs that has that militaristic tone to it that we thought was such a good blend for today's service. And thank you, Rebecca, for that really respectful treatment that you gave it. Welcome, everybody. We begin our services at Westwood Unitarian with a call to land liberation. Westwood is on Treaty 6 territory and the home of the Métis. But I wanna invite you all to just pause for a moment today, rather than me having prepared words that I ask you to connect to, I'd ask you to just take a breath, close your eyes if you feel comfortable and safe doing so. Think about where you are physically situated in this moment. If your feet can go solid to the ground, that would be great, but you can imagine that too. Think about the many generations of people who have come before you, maybe your ancestors, definitely someone's ancestors. Think about the first people who lived here who traveled through here, who settled or hunted, who gathered and met and celebrated here. And we remember on this day and every day that we are never a separate independent piece of life. We are all part of that interdependent web of all existence and our relationship is one to the other. Thank you. Welcome to the Westwood Unitarian Sunday morning service. A special welcome to any newcomers or visitors, people who are new to Unitarian Universalist services. We are so grateful to have you with us this morning or watching on the recording later. Westwood is a compassionate community of free religious thought, inviting all people to rest 
grow, and serve the world. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome in this place. My name is Ann Barker, and I have the honor of serving as minister to this congregation. We have many wonderful volunteers, staff, and musicians helping out this morning. Most of them are named on your screen. And there are so many others who work behind the scenes doing the essential tasks that keep these Zoom cameras rolling. Our speaker this morning is Corporal Maddie Webb, a Westwood member that you probably know as Maddie, like it says in his window. But today we are being invited more deeply into Maddie's lived experience, specifically the intersection of being trans and serving in the Canadian military. We are grateful for Maddie's willingness to share stories and lessons of his life and work. Now, if you have a chalice nearby, this would be a great time to bring it forward or a candle or imagine one in your window. We are going to begin with a chalice lighting from the book for praying out loud. And it is collected by L. Annie Forrester. These are interfaith prayers for public occasions. And this one is one that um, the editor Annie wrote. No worries. It's called To Hear One Another. The ringing of a bell calls us to worship. You have to imagine the bell ringing because it's awful to ring a bell on Zoom. Bad things happen to your ear bowls. The pounding of a drum calls us to war. The popping of a cork calls us to celebration. What is the sound that calls us to hear one another? Listen, listen carefully. It is here in the silence, listen deeply. The beating of our own hearts calls us to ourselves, calls us to be our true selves, calls us to be our best selves, calls us to be what we might become. Listen, there is another sound. The breath of our neighbor calls us outside ourselves, calls us to be companions, calls us to be allies, calls us to be partners. Listen, we must heed the call of our own hearts where love and truth, caring and justice are born. Listen, we must heed the call of others to gather together for some great purpose where passion and fidelity, compassion and equity are nourished. The hammering silence calls us together that we may do the work we cannot do alone. Let us heed the calls that come in the silence that we may be well and do good in this world together. Amen. So we light our chalices this morning in the spirit of good. Now it is time for our candles of joy and concern. And the sharing of joys and concerns is an integral part of Westwood Unitarian spiritual practice. It's a time when people share what is close in their hearts and on their minds so that we may deepen our connections with one another, sharing support, compassion, and celebrations. If you have a joy or concern you'd like to share, we invite you to type it into the chat while Rebecca plays. Simple gift.
Thank you, everyone. Now we have a special element this morning. Um, you know that on the last Sunday of the month, we sing happy birthday to all the people who have a birthday in, um, in that month. But this is a little bit different. This is Westwood's birthday. So that will be on Tuesday. Westwood will turn 40. So in the land of congregations, Westwood is still a baby. But 40 is a grown up. So yay. Yay for the celebration. Yay for the goodness. And yay for Rebecca and Harmonia for creating a beautiful, special piece of music for us so that we might celebrate Westwood's birthday. Now the birthday is on Tuesday and the partying and celebration will happen in the year to follow. This is just that beginning kickoff of joy.
Thank you so much, Rebecca, for your creative wizardry there. And we'd be remiss if we didn't say out loud that that song is written by Tony Turner, who is a Canadian Unitarian Universalist, who um, I think lived in Ontario when he wrote this, but now is a part of the Nanaimo congregation. So I am going to physically light one candle in my window, one final candle for all the unspoken joys and concerns that we carry in our hearts that you may always find this to be a caring and compassionate place where you could share your story. Now, please, remaining muted, would you join me at home in the affirmation you see on your screen? May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. During our Zoom services, we like to use our offertory time to say, there's the contact information on the screen. If you'd like to make a contribution, we would like to be very grateful to you. And we want to lift up people whose work and efforts have made a real difference. And so today I want to lift up the worship committee at Westwood Unitarian, who has always served faithfully and done the labor of figuring out our service schedule, recruiting people and recruiting service leaders and causing everything to occur. And then through these years of the pandemic has really carried extra weight feeling the obligation to uh, shift us online, to get us um, things that translate into a still a spiritual worshipful experience. And when it was hard to recruit folks to speak or to service lead, they did it themselves. They have filled so many gaps in our congregational life. And I could not be more grateful to have worked with the worship team that has carried us through this time. We all hoped that we would be back in person by now um, and doing a blended service both online and in person. And I, there is some disappointment we carry that we are not there yet, but the worship team has been heroic in the absence for that. And thank you, Lorraine, for your leadership in helping us get ready for multi-platform ministry, which we hope to launch in the fall. So now let's sing the affirmation, the musical generosity affirmation along with our beloved Rebecca. From you I receive, to you I give. Now, last week's speaker, like last week's speaker, Maddie is relatively new to Westwood, and in his short time with us, he has invested himself in the community, participating in Sunday services and in programming, attending the service leaders training and acting as service leader multiple times this spring, and this morning will be the second time we've been gifted with him as our feature speaker. Maddie loves musicals if you haven't already caught on to that fact. And I suspect he'll grace us with more musical references this morning, so watch for it. We are grateful for the time he has spent with us here at Westwood zooming in from Cold Lake, Alberta. Before he begins, I wanna say that I imagine that each of us in one way or another has complex thoughts or feelings about the Canadian military. And I ask you like in the opening reading to just see if you can lay those down for the next 20 minutes or so and listen with fresh ears to whatever it is Maddie has to say to us this morning. For most of us, this kind of service to our country is far removed from our ordinary experience, but for Corporal Maddie Webb, it is his daily practice. Over to you. Definitely, yes, daily practice is, uh, I think practice is the key word there. 
Uh, today, I'm going to take you on a journey across time, across Canada, and across generations. Back to a time when life was different. Forward to a place where two minds shared a moment. And into a life where the real world seems so far away. This journey is a part of who I am. It is certainly not all of who I am, but rather a glimpse into a portion of my full journey. This journey begins with a dream, not the one you have when you're asleep, or the con but the kind that starts with a spark of imagination. I recall going to Canada Day celebrations in Ottawa one year and being so excited to meet the Air Force pilots who had just returned from missions overseas. I actually still have that RCAF poster with all of their untidy scribbles of call signs and names I don't think I will ever be able to read. I also have passing memories of the, of the snowbirds in Toronto at the Canadian National Exhibition, those little jets with the smoke coming from their tails as they made streaks across the sky and looped and swirled and drew hearts to say thank you to the crowds of people. Those moments of thinking what a brotherhood that seemed to be. To trust someone so much that you'll fly right at them, hoping that they will turn. No, not hoping, knowing they will turn. The only trouble was I hated to fly. I mean, that wasn't the only trouble. The real trouble was that I was a girl and girls don't really fit into the brotherhood very well. Not at that time, and sadly, I think it will take us a little while longer yet to dismantle the brotherness of this hood. And so as I grew older, the dream faded, but it never really left. It actually came flying back into the picture at a very odd moment in my life. Uh, well, not odd, drug-induced. Um, to paint a picture of how incredibly inebriated I was when I started on the path to join the military, imagine this. I had just had the second of my four transitional surgeries and I was on heavy painkillers. Now, for those of you who haven't met me in person yet, I am nearly child-sized. I should be given child dosages for most medications. I was not given child dosages at that time. I remember we were living in a two-story row house where the bedrooms were upstairs, uh, and I was not allowed to use the stairs during recovery, so we had brought a mattress down to the living room, plopped it on the floor in front of the TV, and there I sat, half-baked on painkillers. My tasks throughout the first week or so included using the washroom and walking in slow circles around the house. It, literally, that was it. Oh, and eating, but I was too high on painkillers to worry about that. Um, one day I was actually feeling rather ambitious and decided that I really wanted to have a bath. Uh, I should mention that bathing was definitely against the rules of recovery, but our cat Hazel was at the end of the mattress on the floor and I saw her licking her paw and stroking her head. So I began to mimic the cat, licking my arm and stroking it along my hair. The only reason I know about this is because my wife tells the story all the time. So just so we're clear here, this is the state I was in when I decided that I wanted to join the Air Force. And here begins that part of the journey. This was in 2011. Uh, I sent an email to the recruiting center. I had been researching and was advised by outsiders that the military would not take a transgender applicant but I wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth. So I asked, and the response was fairly concise. In order to be accepted, you have to be finished. Uh, finished what? What does that even mean? Uh, at that point in my life, I hadn't really decided if I was going to pursue gender affirmation, affirmation surgery. By the way, GAS is actually a very good acronym for it. Ask me about why someday, but not now. I thought the options for surgery sucked. I actually still think the options suck, but that's a totally other journey as well. This journey is about what happened next. 
we're going to jump forward a couple of years here. Stay with me. Won't be painful. Although some of the memories are quite painful. Upon arrival in Montreal for surgery, I went to stay at a bed and breakfast owned and operated by the most wonderful woman. There was another guest there at the time. After one of our dinners together, we sort of looked at each other, sizing each other up, not sure of the reason each other was there. I mean, for all I knew, this person was just visiting Montreal and happened to like the location. This person was 82 years old. After the sizing up process uh, and the owner of the BMB very clearly letting us know that we were both there for the same reason, we sat having a wonderful conversation. This 82 year old had spent their life in the Canadian military. Perfect. I could gain so much knowledge from this person. Uh, and the first words were very harsh and very hard to hear. Imagine, she said, sitting in an office with a young person across from you. As a commanding officer, I wanted to sit there and support this person who was coming to me to tell me they wanted to transition. And all I had ever wanted to do was transition. But my military was not built to handle this. My military was afraid of people like me, people like us. My military was not kind. My military was not mine. Very heavy words. To say I was discouraged by her words would not be doing justice to the situation. Here I was, 29 years old, about to undergo the thing that would allow me to join the military. And this, it was just an absolutely crushing experience. But I pushed on. And by the way, bravo to her for being 82 and finally being able to live in a body that looked what, like she wanted to see in the mirror. Her story is actually something I was very humbled to be a part of but this is not the place for all of the lessons I learned from her. You can ask me about that sometime else too. The next stop on my journey of transness in the military would be at basic training. Knowing what I had learned, I knew that the older people were, the less likely they would be supportive of me. And by they, I mean the staff. I recall being given a choice within the first week of training. Either I get my vaccination booklet from childhood faxed in, or I get all the shots again. And I don't know if you know, but that's a lot of needles and they do them all at once. Like four in one arm, four in the other arm. I didn't want to be a pin cushion. So this was gonna be my first exercise in walking the fine line of not wanting to be harmed by my differences. So I talked to the only member of the staff who was female, um, no offense to the men in the room, but the females are generally easier to talk to about these types of things, especially military members. Um, and I actually gave her a heads up that my vaccination booklet was on its way but it would have a different name on it. And uh, if she could please keep that under her hat because fear, anxiety, I don't know all these people and all that jazz. Not only would it have a different name, but it would also have that dreaded F. Now that's all well and good for some people, but I am not an F. Uh, I made a very bad F to be perfectly honest. And here's the point in the journey that is basically on a loop. While I think it's fairly safe to say that trans folks need to choose their circles very carefully, when you're in the, middle, in the military, you're in the circle already. It isn't a terrible circle. Well, actually it is a terrible circle. It's a triangle, except with no points. Okay, well, one point. It's like a triangle shaped circle. Either way, once you're in, you're in. Everyone has to accept you because this is a family like no other family. We do things, we go through things that people who haven't been exposed to military life wouldn't understand. From exercises to exercising, from training to operations, from making friends to losing friends, from posting to posting, 
there's a sort of permanence to the impermanence of this life. And the loop for me is this. I'm constantly on guard to determine who in this upside down ice cream cone, I can trust enough to let in. And not just who to trust to let in, but how to navigate around those who are actually in the brotherhood. Because I present male very convincingly, especially after they let us grow beards, um, there's no second glance that really comes my way. There's no sugarcoating or feminizing of any conversation. I have the unfortunate privilege to be exposed to conversations, ideas, and personalities that are not offended by my outward gender. They don't know. And as soon as I learned what they don't know really meant, it became that game of us and them. While I have always thought of myself as male as early as four years old, I only really recall a couple of instances of gender dysphoria before my military career. Uh, once in elementary school, when there was a rumor going around that I stuffed my bra, which was completely false, I didn't want them. Why would I ever want them bigger? Uh, and pretty much any time I had to wear dresses, which thankfully was not that often. But in the military, male has a different sort of meaning. As a male dominant force, there can be long periods of time during which only men are employed in certain areas. What this actually has allowed is a culture of free flowing conversations that would never happen in front of women with little to no consequences for the words that are said. And so for me, someone who has lived female bodied and has had to deal with the cat calls and the body shaming coming from men in the past, I have a very different attitude towards those conversations than straight cisgendered men do. My journey and experience in the military has been very colored by the fact that I live that life. I don't wanna say it's been a difficult journey because of being trans. In fact, the maleness of my outward appearance has actually served me well. Uh, let's go back to, to basic training. I'm gonna focus a, a lot on basic training in this because the, the rest is a little bit harder to describe, I guess. Something that is actually really a bit unique um, to the job of being in the military is that there's actually a considerably large amount of time when you happen to be naked around your coworkers. Um, definitely more naked time than I have ever experienced in any other job uh, by a lot, actually. I can't recall a time when I was working as a trainer in a call center that I was ever naked with the people I work with. Anyways, uh, the point is that one of my fondest memories from basic training was the time that I overheard some of my coworkers commenting on the smallness of my penis. Now I know what you're thinking, isn't that a bad thing? The smallness part is not something that is very nice to be said. However, as a trans man, I was just simply excited to hear the words Maddie's penis said together in a sentence. Perhaps that is the confidence that I took with me when I left basic training. I figured that I was in the gang, a, a full-blown member who had a member that looked like a member. The biggest challenges I've actually faced have really been due to that fallacy. I'm unable to be a full part of that gang despite the membership rules of members because quite frankly, I don't want to be. I am happily immune to the cisgendered straight male privilege that exists in this organization. Several times I've actually been asked how I could possibly support this organization and be a part of it when historically it has not been very nice to the LGBTQ2 community. My response is always the same. How can we as LGBTQ2 members hope to change anything about cultural inequity or organizational misguidance if we don't bring ourselves, our true selves, inside to shake things up? If I don't continue to put myself in situations where I can help drive the changes of this organization that it needs, how can I ever hope that it will do it on its own? 
My time so far in the military has certainly not been easy on my body or on my mind. I would in fact say that my resiliency in the face of my challenges has come solely from the strength that I draw on from being trans. I have found myself in situations where drawing on my trans strength has been both a gift and a curse. Uh, one such time, again, going back to basic training, I recall using my unique ability to make light of a situation. In order to encourage my section to go faster during an obstacle course run, a member of the course staff decided that it would be a good idea to make fun of us, a group of all male recruits by yelling out, come on, what are you, a bunch of girls? I made the choice decision to yell back, not anymore, Sergeant. I don't think I have ever ever been apologized to more quickly or with more worry in someone's voice than I was at that moment. That particular moment was one of the better ones I've been involved in where I was able to rely on my trans identity and my quick wit to point out someone else's flawed logic. There have been so many other instances in my career up to this point that I've been inspired by what some would say is my stubbornness in the face of authority. Some have gone quite well, others not so much, but I have to keep going back to thinking that I can have the chance to open up someone else's mind or point out someone else's flawed logic on how to get people to run faster on an obstacle course. I can't honestly say that the military has historically been a kind-hearted, open-minded workplace. Not in light of the Arbor Report on Sexual Misconduct, which I participated in. Not in light of the hater and DD class action lawsuits, which I am one of the over 19,000 claimants. Not in light of the purge class action lawsuit, which my friend from, Mont from my surgery time in Montreal was no doubt affected by. But I do have to say that I must continue to have hope. Hope that all of these past actions and inactions can and must be corrected for the future. Being proud and loud isn't always the easiest thing to do. In fact, I would honestly say it's one of the most difficult things to do. To stand up and say, not today, Satan, credit to Bianca Del Rio, in the face of past harm that is not actually that far in the past is quite, quite a challenge indeed. But we cannot run and we cannot hide. We need to move into uncomfortable positions and uncomfortable situations in order to make them uncomfortable for those who need to take a look inward. Uh, one such person was a doctor that I had to deal with once. He was concerned about a particular elevated level in my blood work at a point in time when I had undiagnosed pneumonia. Uh, this level of blood work was showing inflammation in the body. I had pneumonia. I don't know if you know, but pneumonia is, a, is an inflammatory lung situation. So his, uh, his idea that, um, sorry, his insistence uh, that I should be tested for HIV was kind of mind blowing to me. His reason for this was as follows. And these are words that he said to me and thankfully that he documented in my file, uh, my medical file that I have through the military. Because I was trans, I must be a sexual deviant or a drug addict. When I told him I've never done drugs and I'd been tested for HIV just a year and a half earlier when I'd had surgery in Montreal and it was negative, and that I'd been with only my wife for the prior 10 years, his response told me everything I needed to know about him. He said that I should be open to the fact that my wife could have cheated on me since I may not be able to satisfy her needs. Not exactly his strongest moment. However, my flat out refusal and me telling him how he was only asking me to have that test 
Because of his biased opinion of trans people, left him, scr left him scrambling to determine what to do next. I actually helped lead the charge on writing up official complaints from a group of three other women who had been treated badly by him as well. I'd like to think that karma played a role in helping handle that situation uh, as he actually had a non-fatal stroke a couple of months later. And while I never wish harm on anyone, I feel he was more harmful to a lot more people and that nice little stroke was a sign of good in the world. There is a definite shift in the world and in particular in the Canadian Armed Forces. I have been asked questions I never thought I would get the chance to answer. I've been asked to give my opinion, to share my experiences, to share my journey, and to be honest in a way that I don't think I ever really expected, despite my hope that my opinion, my experiences, my journey, and my honesty would be of value. To share one last experience with you all today, I'd like to journey to a different time and place. Don't worry, the Broadway lyrics are coming up just in case you were concerned that they weren't coming. They are still coming, hang tight. I have been involved in many conversations about culture and change and how to make the military a safer place for people who are different. And by different, I mean those not in the straight, cisgender, male conflux of identity. I have often been told that the kind of culture change that is needed in the military will take generations to accomplish, that we will need to wait it out for the changes to happen. However, I agree with the recent report from former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbor, in which she says of sexual misconduct that, quote, Corrective measures are urgently needed to create an even and safe playing field for women in the profession of arms. And these measures will benefit the other marginalized members of the CAF. This cannot be left to the hope that generational change will suffice to provide equality, end quote. To end this journey today, I'm gonna to conclude with that different time and place being the future and my hope for it to be a safer place, not only in the military, but in society as a whole. This will only be accomplished by thinking of these corrective measures playing out by taking advantage of the opportunities to share our voices, to share our journeys, and to be reminded of some of the immortal words of Jonathan Larson from the Broadway musical Rent. There's only now, there's only here. Give in to love or live in fear. No other path, no other way, no day but today. There's only us. There's only this. Forget regret or life is yours to miss. No other road, no other way. No day but today. No day but today. Thank you. Maddie, your words are better than my words for the closing words. So I'm going to ask you to, if you've put them away, can you bring those words back up again? Because after our um, 
I'm going to grab the chalice and then I'd love for you to read them as our chalice extinguishing this morning. I think they have more impact than what I was going to say. Like all of them or? <laughs> yeah, start at the beginning, Meg. just the show tune. Come on. <laughs> Just to show to you, got it. There's only now, there's only here. Give in to love or live in fear. No other path, no other way, no day but today. There's only us, there's only this. Forget regret or life is yours to miss. No other road, no other way, no day, but today. Thank you. We extinguish our chalices, but we carry the light of inspiration from these and all the other words that Maddie has shared with us this morning. Thank you, Maddie, for your willingness to do this work. It was really moving and yeah, yeah. Okay, our closing song this morning is number 1014 from the Teal Hymnal and um, Jennifer McMillan recorded it for us and gave us permission to use it again this morning because she did such a lovely job of it. And so um, we offer to you answering the call of love.
only does that song capture the message that Maddie was trying to hand to us on a silver platter this morning, but it also represents one of our Unitarian Universalist songwriters being willing to recognize that in the original version of the words, there was a barrier to inclusion and changing the words to open up the song to speak to more people. And so the language has changed from the original if you have an old hymnal in your possession. We want to cause change to occur in the universe in the best and most positive ways. Thank you, Maddie, for your commitment and your courage for serving in what is such a complex situation. And just a friendly reminder that next Sunday, um, June 19th is my final service with Westwood. That will be on Zoom. There's been a little bit of confusion. The service is still on Zoom, so folks from anywhere can attend. And then in the afternoon, there is a social at Westwood in person, um, outside as much as weather permits from two to four. And there will be some words and ceremony at three but you are welcome to come and go even if you just have a few minutes in the afternoon.